I was born in uh, 1960. I was born in Happy Valley because there was no hospital here, but basically, you know, lived all my life here, just about, grew up here, certainly. Um, I worked at the Correctional Center from 1986 up to maybe 10, 12 years ago. So during a, a portion of that time, I lived in Happy Valley, we bought a house there, but as soon as something came up down here, I moved back here in 2000. So I've been spent most of my life here in Mud Lake for sure. Uh, back in the in the 60s and 70s when we were growing up, we were baby boomers, so there were lots of kids here. There were about 30 of us or more. So, you know, we were we didn't know what the word board meant. Depending on the time of year, we always were active. You know, whether it was sliding in the winter or skating in the fall, baseball or soccer in the summer, it was. A matter of picking up the phone, dialing two digits, and you had your buddy on the phone. Our phone number was 29, so <laughs> it wasn't too hard to round up a team or, or somebody to go and play. And uh, thinking back now, I mean, most of the men here at that time were working on the base, so, you know, there was a, a real routine in the village. In the mornings, the men would all go off to work and they'd come back in the evenings. The women were left here to look after the kids and do what had to be done around the house. And, uh, you know, it's, I think because of the routine and because of the quietness of this little place, we just felt so safe and secure and, you know, we're, there's nothing to touch us here. We're as safe, in as safe a place we possibly can be. But that's, uh, that's certainly not the case anymore. So I remember there was a forest fire one time, not too far from here and the water bombers were coming and landing in the lake and that was a big event. I mean, there was, of course, a lot of excitement around that. The fire wasn't too, too close. So. But, uh, no, we, we were lucky with regards to fires. It's so wooded, heavily wooded here. And, you know, if a fire happened close, it would be in pretty big danger. But, you know, that, that was always the biggest concern here, certainly not floods. And you're all living by, obviously, right by the water here. so. All the homes have boats or certainly yes, it, a way to get out of here if there was something like a fire. Something like that, yeah, would be no problem to. I mean, we're probably reluctant to leave a lot of things behind. We'd take what we could, but you know, we'd probably have time to take a lot of stuff too. Because like you said, everybody down here has boats. Most, most people, most families have more than one, so that wouldn't be an issue. You're from here, your parents are from here, your yeah. grandparents are from here. I have deep roots here, yes, and uh, the history of Mud Lake is, is very rich too in history. It's well over 200 years of, you know, old and uh, arguably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, permanent settlement in Upper Lake Melville. So there's a lot of history here and uh, there's a very deep connection to this place by everybody that you know, that's from here and, and spent a lot of years here, as you probably have found out from some of the interviews you've done here. You know, there's there's a lot of sentiment, a lot of a lot of connection to the land here and, and to this village. And it's uh, it's a t it's a troubling time right now. With regards to uh, eight months ago and um, in that time. Um, I know you were home in Mud Lake that day. I was, yes. So can you just tell me, um, just give me a timeline of that day and, and what it was like for you. Okay, well around midday I suppose the water was, you know, was getting high. I mean high with regards to previous floods that we had. It was, it was getting up fairly close to the bridge and you know, I said uh, this might be a new record because I've witnessed a couple of years where, where it came up like that. And uh, that evening, it's the same thing was happening, and boy, it just kept coming and coming, and all of a sudden, uh, I think we got a new record. We're getting close to the bridge. But uh, we knew that there was a new, a new, um, new part to the equation of what causes floods that year. The cofferdam was in place for the first time and the freeze-up that we had last fall 
was something unlike I've ever seen or I think anybody's ever seen before. The water was extremely high when it froze up. What caused that, I think, I think it's, uh, it was caused by a, vari a, a variable thing. So it wasn't just one thing. I think there were uh, you know, a, a quite a few factors at play that made the water high. And because it froze so high, the water along the shores and on the sandbars was was a lot deeper than normal. And on the shores and on the sandbars, what, what water is there? Normally on the sandbars, on the river, there's no water at all. Usually when it freezes up, it's fairly low water and the sandbars are still sandy until the snow gets on them. But uh, if there is water on them, it will freeze whatever the depth is on the sand. It'll freeze right to the bottom. Same thing along the shores, it'll freeze right to the bottom. And like I said, it was such high water that it created very, very thick ice that winter. And when you, when we cross the river, normally there are, are dips and, and uh, you know, the little lumps where the sandbars are. You can tell where the sandbars are, but last year it was flat the whole way across. And I was concerned before freeze up about where we were going to get over the bank on the other side of the parking lot on the, by the Mud Lake Road because because of the erosion, it was straight up and down basically, and I was wondering, you know, how are we going to get over that on Skidoo? And finally, when the river did freeze, and it filled in and, and we were able to cross, uh, that was something very new to me too. When we went on the cross for the first time, the ice was level with the parking lot. Like we were, our Skidoos were up at the same height as the trucks when we were on the ice, and that was just, it just felt so weird. I mean, that was so different. And had you ever seen that before? Never, ever. Nothing like that. Well, I was wondering when the the water was going to slow down and, and ebb like it always had before. You know, it's, you just wait for it. You keep watching the ice, see if it's slowing down. If it's slowing down, you know that, that it's getting close to, to stopping. So once it stops, you wait and see, okay, see the ice start ebbing and see it go back out again. Okay, it's it's over. The, it obviously cut a place through the the river, the ice did, you know, I made a clear path through, so now the water is receding like it normally happens, but it didn't stop. It kept coming and coming, and it was getting dark, and it was still coming, so everybody was, was kind of on edge then, you know, wondering, gee, how high is it going to get before it stops? Nobody, I don't think, at that point even still thought that it was going to come over the high banks, but... Uh, no, I kept an eye on it. Hockey came on. Of course, I started watching hockey, and between periods, I'd go and have a look to see if it stopped yet. It still wasn't. I think around 12, 30, 1 o'clock, I looked out, and and the ice was barely moving. Christine had gone to bed, and I said, I think I'll go get some sleep, too, because it looks like it's crested. So I went in, uh, and I told her, I said, uh, I think I'm getting ready for bed, too, because I think the, the danger is past. And... Uh, just went out to turn off the TV or whatever, the phone ring that was Watts Rumble. And he said, boy, the water's coming in so fast. And I said, I checked this a few minutes ago and it looked like it was stopped. And while I was talking to him, I heard a couple of big bangs. And I said, Watts, did you hear that? And, no, I didn't hear anything. He said, I said, I heard a couple of loud bangs. So I went out on the step and it was ice hitting the bridge. I mean, really loud ice and debris just smacking into the bridge. And uh, and I said, we're going to have to call people, and we're going to have to get out of here. You know, this is coming up to the top of the bank, and, and there's still no sign of slacking off. You know, we didn't know how it was going to get, but we knew a lot of houses in Mud Lake now had to be flooded, the ones on the lower land. It's up to the top of our bank, which it never did before. So we started calling people. You know, we called. Mud Lake was basically divided into three sections where the helicopter could come, so I called... I called a person in each of those three and, and said, I'd like for you to call your neighbors and tell them to come and, and go to whichever designated area they could get to. So that's basically how we spent the night. A lot of people came to my house. They, they, they met at the community hall, which had no heat or anything, uh, nowhere comfortable to sit. So I told them, I live next to the hall. So I said, come to my place and, and we'll wait there. So a lot of them that were in our zone did that. And, uh, you know, we were calling government officials and trying to get 
something organized to come and get us at first light. Uh, at first they said we could, you know, send a chopper down maybe 6, 6.30. I said, no, we don't want it. We want it as soon as possible. We don't know how much higher this is going to get. Some people are, people's houses are in danger as we speak. So, but I think 5.30 the first chopper showed up and, uh, and the evacuation began. So, what was that like for you that morning, seeing all, you know, I mean, at, at daylight, because that night before was very dark. It was very dark, very stormy, a miserable night. You go out into the, you know, it was windy and wet, snow and rain mixed. Um, when I realized how high the water was, I decided to go and check on my snowmobiles, which were stored over by my shed. And the, the big machine I have for grooming was in the water. So I said, I better go and bring that, try and drive that up out to the ramp of my shed. So I got my, my knee rubbers on and I went out and it was, I couldn't get there with my knee rubbers so I got my hip waders, put them on. And uh, I walked to the machine and started it up. It started fine. And I was going to drive it onto my ramp and when I pressed the throttle, nothing happened. The belt was in the water, it wouldn't move. And I realized then when I walked back to my ramp that I wouldn't have got it up there anyway because the ramp was floating. The skis would have just went underneath it. So there was nothing else I could do. It was, you know, it was time to figure out what we were going to do to get out of there, what we had to take with us. So, yeah, it was, it was not a pretty sight. It was, it was something that I never thought I would uh, witness, at least not until the North Spur was completed, or, or the main dam, I mean, and the North Spur gave way. I expect that to happen, but uh, I, I wasn't expecting anything, any kind of flooding prior to the completion of the dam. Um, you and your wife were home that day and that evening, so you had your family close. Yeah. I know you, uh, from your mom's interview, that she was here by herself that night. Yes. Couldn't have been easy for you? That was pretty hard, yeah. Knowing that we couldn't get over to her. She was all alone, but I, I kept calling her and she kept calling. We were, you know, we kept pretty constant uh, conversation going when we could. We had to do those emergency calls in the meantime, so... But uh, no, I kept her up to date on what was going on, and, and she knew that there were neighbors here who could come here if they needed to, you know, if she needed them. So, but uh, no, it was not a good situation having her here, 82 years old, all by herself with you know, just her dog for company. So, what was the weather like that morning when, when you know, you you guys have been waiting all night for a helicopter and we were. finally arrives at five or five thirty. Yeah. What was the weather like then, and what was that scene like? Uh, what I remember was, what's etched in my mind is that big <clears throat> Griffin helicopter, you could hear it coming, thump, thump, thump in the distance. And when it got close to the, to the community hall where it was going to land, it seemed to take forever to land. And I was wondering, why? Why, why has it taken so long for it to come down? But it was a fairly small field, a big helicopter. And I noticed that the back door was open and there was a guy leaned out looking back at the tail rotor to make sure, I guess, you know, keeping in contact with the pilot as to where we were situated. So they were a little, you know, it was new territory for them, so they were being extra cautious, which is a good thing. But in the meantime, we were a bit concerned with time, too, because we had a lot of people to evacuate. But, uh, no, eventually when it landed, uh, the weather, I think, was, I think the rain and the sleet was, and the snow was stopped, and it was just gray and... It was just getting daylight. It was pretty miserable. Cold. Yeah, well, got all that rotor washed from the helicopter too, but uh, it was pretty powerful. Do you think when, like you mentioned that it was hard for, it might have been difficult for that helicopter to land because of the small space, but I've heard from other interviews that people were literally walking through water to get to that helicopter. Was there water surrounding the area that you were in at that time? Well, when we went to the hall, when we thought the helicopter was coming first, I don't think there was any water at all on the field, but before the chopper arrived, it was start, it was still rising, and it started coming in by the hall and, and going on towards the cemetery. Like There was a, a stream of water had started, but by the time I got out of there, there was, there was a lot more area covered in water and still rising. And did you leave in the helicopters? We did, yeah. I, I didn't go on the first trip. I went on the second one. And uh, it was, that was a strange feeling, leaving Mudlick and, and not knowing 
what we were going to come back to, you know, what we we're going to find, what was going to be left, or what was going to be damaged. Uh, I wasn't expecting any damage in my house because I have a basement and I never, I never had a drop of water in my basement uh, as long as I was living there. And uh, when when I came back down after after the river opened up. We, we looked in the basement and everything was floating, three and a half feet of water, and just everything was ruined. It was, it was uh, quite a shock to me because I wasn't expecting any at all. I knew the water didn't come right to my house, but apparently what happened, it came up through the ground into my basement. So we weren't as lucky as we thought or we were hoping. I mean, we knew a lot of our neighbors were very unfortunate, and we thought we were going to be one of the lucky ones. But well, I guess we were in a sense, but we weren't the luckiest. It could have been better. Right, and because you you hadn't had any experience with flooding in your basement or your home before. None, no, none whatsoever. You obviously didn't have, you weren't um, in your mind putting things away or saving things. It didn't even cross my mind. I, I, I thought that, uh, you know, it would be safe like it always was. So. But again, once it came up to the top of the bank, I guess all bets were off. We didn't know what to expect them, but there was no time to do anything at that point, you know. Like with my skidoo, there, there was nothing I could do then, it was too late. And the basement was still dry when we left. There was there was nothing there then. And that was... How long were you away then? Like how, how long I, before you I, came back? We left Wednesday morning. I believe it was Friday I came back. Um, we, we were... I can't say enough about, about the... Uh, the help that we received from organizations in Happy Valley Goose Bay, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay, like everybody just, and individuals too, people just, uh, I can't, I can't thank them enough for, for the kindness and the, and the compassion that they showed to us, you know, it was, it was touching. But, uh, no, when we'd, when we'd meet, like, a couple of organizations put off suppers for the community, so we'd all you know, have a chance to get together again and, and chat with each other. But at, uh, at those, we'd always get updates about, you know, what the ice was doing because the river was still plugged when we had, uh, you know, had evacuated. And uh, this, I think it was Friday, we got a report that the river was moving and, and the boys, there was a couple of young fellows thought they could get down in boat. So myself and my cousin said, well, let's see if we can go down with them, which is what we did. We came down and, and I'll never forget what I saw coming down the river. The, the ice was piled up on the sandbars like mountains. We've never seen anything like that before. The, the, there was ice up in the woods along the shores of the river. Trees were bowled over. Like a, it looked like a bulldozer had gone through. It was unbelievable. Came into the channel and the same thing on the back of the island. There was a huge pile of ice and trees knocked down. A big clearing in the woods looked like somebody had gone in with a chainsaw cleared a spot to build a cabin. That was all done by ice, just unheard, unheard of, you know, and uh, then we came into the village and you just see debris everywhere. Debris is what's stuck in my mind. It's in the channel, in the willows, everywhere, it's just debris. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to expect at my place at that time when I got to my house. And when I got to my landing, I, I have a floating wharf and it goes up a ramp to a, a fixed landing. When I got there, my floating dock was resting on top of the rail on my floating landing, which is up near the top of the bank. And we had to, three of us had to lift it off to get it back into the water. So it was, uh, it was quite a sight. Um, my boat was already tied to the bank there. So once I got down, I, I called Christine, my wife, and I said, you know, you can come down if you want and, and see what we can do because this house, my mother's house, was not affected by the flood. So we, we got a generator from a friend to come down and, and brought it to her house. And we tried to save, you know, the, the food that she had in the fridge and freezer. So we stayed here for a couple of days until, you know, the emergency people came down and started putting the power back on. And then we started to uh, to tackle our own mess at our place. Let's talk about the 
feeling in Mud Lake since then? Oh, there's a very... It's hard to describe, but there's... There's an ugly feeling in Mud Lake. It's a, a negative feeling. Um, people have... I know one guy bought a, a big picture window for his house. Uh, he was going to put it in this fall, but he talked with his wife and said, you know, what's, what's the point? Maybe it's going to flood again. And well, why put it in? And, and there are a couple other instances like that too. One lady said, uh, I don't even feel like cleaning my house anymore. And a lot of people have that same feeling, you know, why bother to do a lot of work? It might be just all for nothing again. We don't know. And, and when I... Not long after I came back, after the flood, there was one guy down here. His place was was in a real mess. Like he had lost almost everything. And he, I went to see him. He was in tears, trying to... He just had his house renovated for, for the Christmas of the previous year. And he had to rip everything out. Like four feet up his walls. The water was, was on his ground floor. Four feet up his walls. And every, all that work that he had done was in ruin. And he had to rip it all out and try and rebuild it uh, before mold set in and before the house would be condemned. And, and he was overwhelmed, naturally. But he, he stayed there and, and he moved everything out of his house that was destroyed. And, and he did it with his bare hands and he started rebuilding. And... I had a few talks with him since then, you know, you got any plans on moving up? And he said, well, this is home. This is where I want to stay. But he said, I did it. I'll do this once. He said, I can't do it again. I can't tear up my house and rebuild it every year. That's, you know, he's, he's not a young fellow. Most people down here are seniors or close to it. And it's a pretty big task to take on something like that. I was lucky myself. My brother-in-law is a, is a uh, contractor, and when when I called him and told him the situation I was in, in a couple of days he had a, a work crew and they were down and tearing everything out of my basement. And, and I was I was lucky. A lot of people down here weren't lucky like that. They didn't have that option. Do you want to talk about the reason for all of this? Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe that there's the cause of this, I think, was complex. And I'd like to go back to 1960s when Churchill Falls, when that project was, was completed. Because prior to Churchill Falls, this river was, was so much different and powerful than it is now, as were Northwest River and other rivers that were dammed at the, at the headwaters but the water the tide in this river i can remember the big eddies it would swirl that's how fast the water was moving there were no sandbars to be seen and it was water from shore to shore basically and uh, i think when when well i know when churchill fall was dammed that that really made a difference in the flow of the river and sandbars started forming, more and more sandbars every year. And on top of that, a few years back, they built a causeway bridge across the river. This too had an effect on the flow because it diverted all the water to one side of the river, to the south side. And of course, that changed the whole dynamics of the river too. And it, and it, it dug a huge gouge underneath the bridge where the water was forced through a lot faster than normal and all that sediment that was taken up with the, the faster water as the water slowed where the river widened again it was deposited making sandbars even worse and at the mouth of the river now back in the 70s I remember there was no sandbar at the mouth of the Churchill River because when we'd get a northeast wind we'd get really rough water because there was nothing blocking it. There was no reef, nothing there. So you get northeast wind straight in from Goose Bay and from Lake Melville. The big waves would come in and hit the current of the river that was going out. Wind going one way, waves going the other, made for pretty big rough water. So after 
uh, you know, probably in the early 80s, the sandbar started to form at the river, and it got bigger and bigger, and now there's an island there with vegetation on it. So we don't get that extremely rough water anymore, but now there's not much ice at the, there's not much room at the mouth of the river for ice to go through. The water is shallower and it's narrower because there's an island now obstructing the middle of the river. So it's a lot easier for ice to jam there now than it was in the past. And this of course is attributed to Churchill Falls and the Bridge Causeway. And of course last year there was a new player in the equation and that was Muskrat Falls. They they built the coffer dam, so they too, you know, they now they had uh, a chance to manipulate the throw, the flow of the river the, to raise or lower the water levels below the dam, which I think they were doing. You know, I think they were experimenting, and I wonder what would happen if we did this or if we did that, and uh, you know, that's what it seemed to me. It was hit or miss. We'll we'll try this and raise the gates so much and lower them so much, see what effect that has, and. I think they were doing that all winter, and I think that that contributed also to the flood because I think that may be part of the reason why we've had such thick ice, why the water was so high. There were other factors that would make the water high in the fall too, like northeast wind, um, perhaps the ice started flowing and blocked at the mouth and dammed and, and that water rose before it froze, that's possible too. But this community is over 200 years old. Um, we've had flooding before, but nothing to this magnitude. There was nothing out of the ordinary, contrary to Dr. Lyndon Schmidt's report. Yes, we had a rapid snow melt, but that wasn't, that wasn't a one-time occurrence. Yes, there might have been rain in the fall. I don't know how that would contribute, but again, if, it, if that was a factor, again, not a one-time occurrence. Actually, when he showed us the graph of that anomaly, of that excess rainfall in the Churchill Valley in November of 2016. I asked how far back did his data go because he had this and the graph was was the it showed the normal or the average amount of rainfall and this particular month of 2016 and I said well, okay well your data goes back 30 35 years whether were, were there ever any other spikes or any other year in the rainfall or was this just a one-off and so actually, I didn't check that, which I found kind of odd. If you're, uh, you know, if, if you're attributing this to one of the causes of your flood, you would think that you would look at your data quite thoroughly and make sure that, you know, that didn't happen before. But again, I, I, I said to him, even if you did check it and you found that there, was, there wasn't another spike, I said, your data is only 30, 35 years old. This community was here for, like I said, over 200 years. So the odds of a spike of rainfall uh, sometime during those 200 years is quite significant, I would think. So no, I think, uh, I'm, well, I'm sure that uh, Churchill Falls, Muskrat Falls, you know, their, their manipulation of the river certainly was a factor. I think there were, again, other things that rapid snow melt, perhaps that played a part, maybe uh, precipitation played a snow uh, part, maybe winds played a part, but I'm sure those things played parts other years in the past. The only difference this time was Muskrat Falls, and I think that was the tipping point. And what happened here in 2017, as bad as it was, was only a shot across the bow to what we can expect if this project goes ahead without an assessment of the North Spur because when the world's most renowned expert on glacial marine clay, which is what the North Spur is comprised of, when he warns that this is not going to hold up, that's not something that should be ignored. He says that Nelcor, who claim that, that the North Spur exceeds the uh, standards set for by the Canadian Dam Association for safety, but what if what they fail to tell you is that they have never, ever, built a dam with a with a uh, structure that's com comprised of glacial marine clay and this natural 
part of the dam. And Dr. Bernander says the modeling they used was the modeling that you would use on a man-made you know, concrete structure. So he says that the modeling they used is inadequate. It is not suitable. They should have used the progressive landslide or the progressive slide modeling, which is what he's afraid is going to happen. There's going to be a progressive landslide. In fact, he, using his method, he did the calculations and so did a master's student in Sweden, Robin Dury, and they both came to the same conclusion that Muskrat Falls, that the North Spur is going to fail. And their, their plan is to raise the water, once the, once the dam is complete, to raise the water level to 39 meters above sea level. Dr. Bernander, through his, his calculations, estimates and is quite sure that the, the North Spur is going to give way before the water even reaches that level. I think around 34, 35 meters is, is going to be a very scary time. And he says once, once the water finds a way through and, and that clay starts to liquefy, it'll happen very, very quickly. It won't be a slow process, it'll happen almost instantaneously and the results will be catastrophic. Many people say it's too late to stop this project. It's too far gone. Too much money has been invested. And if, if they were building a solid structure that is that you know is going to hold up or is a very good chance of holding up, I, it would be hard to argue that point. But that's not the case. If it's doomed to fail, the project will be worthless, but worse than that, this community, a good chunk of Happy Valley Goose Bay will be gone. Many lives will be lost. So we were asking, the Labrador land protectors have been asking for months now. We have written to the Premier and asked him for an independent study. And I mean independent, as, as which means somebody who is not in any way affiliated with Nelcor. Or, or this project and uh, to date we haven't even received a response from the Premier and I don't think it's a lot to ask. When people are living in fear of their lives and when you have legitimate world-renowned experts saying you're in danger, how can the government ignore that and not at least have a, an independent study ordered to, to, if nothing else, to give people peace of mind. People who are, are afraid of drowning in their beds, he can't offer assurance. That makes me think that Nelcor is not as confident, nor is the, is the government with this project, as they claim to be. If they're confident, why don't they come forward with an outside entity who will say, yes, they have it absolutely right. They did the work. The mitigation methods they've taken are sound, Nothing to worry about. We would be able to sleep a little easier perhaps at night, but it's not going to happen. They're not going to come back with that result, and the government knows it. So, you know, where do we stand from here?